Welcome back. You're watching the Jacksonville History Show, brought to you by the Jacksonville Historical Society and Comcast. I'm Harry Reagan, president of the Historical Society. Now our guests are from the Museum of Southern History, Tesh Brundick and Van Seagraves. Welcome both of you to the History Show. Thank you, Thank you sir. Thank you, sir. A little bit of history about the Museum of Southern History. Uh, uh, yes, sir. It, uh, it was founded back around the early 80s, 1983. You might take that date on it by some gentlemen, especially one named um, Mr. Giles Patterson. He and his wife, uh, he, uh, she's obviously widowed, but uh, she's still very active in the museum herself. There was some other gentlemen involved, and one of our recent, uh, unfortunately deceased uh, curators, Mr. Mr. Mike Snyder. He was very active in this uh, museum, did a great job. Uh, originally, we were located on the corner of there, just about where Roosevelt Boulevard and uh, Ortega Boulevard come together. It was just in a little small building, and we had a, we're trying to put a library in there too, but we, of course, since moved, I guess, six, seven years ago into much larger headquarters on Herschel Street. Uh, so where, it, where on Herschel, uh, just so people can uh, find it? What is that correct? 4304 Herschel Street. Okay. We're not quite on the corner. There is a service station and uh, I think a dry cleaning right We're there. We're actually on the beach. corner of Lexington and Herschel. Uh -huh. uh -huh. You yeah, cannot no miss it. It's very good. And we have flags out there and plenty of free, uh, free parking. Mm -hmm. Free parking. No problem at all on the thing. Uh, and so just generally, uh, someone who wanted to come and see the Museum of Southern History, what would they see? I right, would say ahead. mostly. Well, yeah, uh, we have a... Uh, a good sampling of collection. The collection itself is based primarily between the war between the states, 1861-65. Uh, we have succession. The first display is on the ordinance of the succession, passed by the state of Florida on January 10, 61. Uh, we have a weapons display, uh, medical, home life, camp scenes, uh, flags, uh, which are probably two of our most prized uh, portions ladies, of the collection. Southern uh, ladies. Southern ladies display. Uh, then, of course, we have two dioramas, one of the Battle of Olusti, which was the largest land battle fought in the state of Florida in February of 1864. And then we have a battle of the uh, a diorama, the Battle of Sharpsburg or Antietam, which was September of 1862. But probably the thing that would, brings us the most repeat visitors is our uh, research library. We have about a 6,000-volume research library. Mm. And a lot of people doing not only just genealogy, but research on their ancestors or that show an interest in the war between the states and, and that portion of our nation's history. And you brought just a few uh, samples of right. things that people could see in the museum. Uh, Tesh, why don't you, you you've got, got the biggest single item there. I'm going to let our expert go okay. through. Okay, this is a, uh, what is known as a, uh, I got it, Tesh. This is what's known in that time frame as an arsenal conversion. Uh, as you can see, it's a single shot musket, smooth bore, 69 caliber. Uh, when it was first made, it had what was known as the Maynard type tape system. Rather, it had a, you'd open this door up, a tape similar to what we would use in the old cap pistols would roll out and you would put it over the nipple, of course, manually load it through the, through the muzzle, pull the hammer back, and the weapon would go off. They found the system was not very reliable. It was subject to wetness and dampness and moisture. So then they converted it to the normal percussion cap system, but they left on this particular conversion, they left the actual Maynard uh, tape system in. Now this weapon, like I said, was a 69 caliber smooth bore. Uh, this is actually a Remington. Uh, you have to remember that when the Confederacy was formed, they had no manufacturers, so they captured a lot of weapons or, or seized weapons when the arsenals and the, when the state succeeded. This, like I say, is a 69 caliber. The standard weapon which became was a 58 caliber, which fired the famous mini ball. Uh, the soldiers were trained to load and fire this weapon to a standard of about three times a minute. Mm. Once again, depending upon the conditions and the ability of the soldier. That was, that's faster than I would have <laughs> guessed. <laughs> right. So, I mean, that, you've got to be fairly proficient. Right. Well, they drilled. You know, it's just, the armies in those days were as typical as they are today. They spent more time drilling and mm -hmm. uh, practicing as, uh, than, we, than, than as we would do in the modern army. The next one is a, what is known as a Maynard Calvary carbine. This is actually, uh, was, this particular one was made in New York. This deep south, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, and Mississippi actually purchased around 2,000 of these from the Maynard uh, Firearms Company in about 1860, 1861, prior to the start of the war. A lot of people don't realize that northern firearms dealers also could see the coming hostilities. Sam Colt came south and sold thousands of weapons to the southerners. So the uh, south was uh, 
saw the war coming and started uh, basically, arming? Basically, yes. Uh, they formed their militia companies from the Indian War time frame. But this particular one is a 50 caliber cavalry weapon, and it was loaded very simply. It was a breech loader. You just opened it up. He would reach into his cartridge box, and the cartridge was a one-piece paper with a bullet on one end, a powder on the other end, slide it in the barrel, slam it shut, pull it back, put a percussion cap on the nipple, and the weapon was ready to fire. Uh, this one was, you know, almost twice as fast, around six times a minute. And lighter. If you're and gonna lighter, be doing especially it, cavalry. Handling it on horseback. Right. Uh, uh, the cavalry, the southern cavalry especially preferred this weapon along with a sawed-off shotgun, mm -hmm. which is very effective, in, as you know, in close combat. Now, the, the typical battle that we've seen in the movies and so forth, I guess, is fairly accurate. Uh, yeah, to a degree, you're, yeah. you're fairly close to the enemy. Uh, yes. Uh, wow. The war between the states was actually the first modern war, as we might consider as, as students of history. Uh, the weaponry was the first modern weaponry. Prior to this, they used uh, the smoothbore muskets, effective range 50 to 60 yards. But as time progressed, uh, they invented the rifle musket. In other words, they, they cut lands and grooves inside the barrel, which caused the, the bullet to spin, which made it much more accurate. Now, instead of 50 to 60, 70 yards, you're looking at five, six, 700 yards. But the tactics didn't change. Still shoulder to shoulder, mass volleys. Not only did you have rifle muskets, but you also had rifle artillery. Mm -hmm. uh, good connection. The smooth bore, they might hit a house at a mile. With a rifled artillery piece, they could almost pick the window at a mile in that home. Tesh, uh, where did the museum get all of these items? Well, like we both, actually about half of it what is on loan. Mm -hmm. The other half is owned by the museum of peace. People locally have debt have been very nice about donating things to us on books, like you said, library and mm -hmm. this type of thing on that. Uh, and I you're, would, you're always on the uh, lookout for additional things uh, that people want to give you? We're always hungry. We'll mm -hmm. take anything we can on that. Yeah, uh, I would like to mention to it, and you probably noticed Van saying that uh, we call it the war between the states. I was going to ask about uh, that. There really, there never was a civil war. A civil war, as you can understand, is when one group of people try to overthrow an existing form of government, which the South was not. The South was fighting, you might call it the Second American Revolution, or fighting for their independence. Uh, the South to this day still believes strict interpretation of the Constitution, where I, I hate to say this, and but I mean, I think it's kind of gotten a little bit too more of a centralized government on the thing. But also, the United States Congress in 1933 did declare that war as the war between the state's official name, not uh, not civil war or anything, but it's easier to say civil war than I guess carry well, that all and, the way and through. Well, and you'd have to admit that you're kind of fighting a, uh, an uphill battle there. <laughs> if I go on yeah. Google and punch in uh, civil war, I'm going to get a lot more hits than <laughs> war between the states. Probably. Well, you'll hear me say it too, I think. I think that well, everybody Robert does. at least yes. said it one of the occasional yes. long there. It was, it was occasionally referred to as, uh, as the civil war. Uh, now, uh, doesn't it, show us some more of your weapons Okay, what here. we have here, this yeah. is uh, one of our prize pieces. Um, these are the Mexican War epaulets of Thomas J. Jackson. He would later become a general in the Confederate States Army. His nickname, of course, was Stonewall. He got that name at the First Battle of Manassas by General B. These were his Mexican War captain's epaulets. He was breveted or temporarily promoted to the rank of captain. He kept these. He was actually stationed in St. Augustine where he and a superior officer, senior officer, had a disagreement. He resigned his commission, went back to Virginia, uh, was an instructor at Lexington, the VMI, Virginia Military Institute. When the war broke out, he was appointed a general um, for a brigade and later became a corps commander under General Lee. During the Shenandoah Valley Campaign in the spring of 1862, he had on his staff a young Captain Jackson, no relation. He gave the young captain his Mexican War epaulets. Of course, Stonewall was uh, shot during the Battle of uh, Chancellorsville by his own troops. Some North Carolinians shot him, and he died 10 days later from pneumonia. The young captain maintained, kept the epaulets. Uh, they stayed in the family, and the museum was very fortunate in getting them from the family. And these must be very valuable. Yes, they are. Yes. They're quite rare. Well, it's a one of a kind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, it's, uh, and when we're talking about the first modern war, the Confederacy uh, also invented uh, basically what is known as the hand grenade we know today. This is an old black powder hand grenade known as a range grenade. It's filled, of course, with black powder. Black powder is an explosive. It's not a propellant. It was filled with black powder, had a percussion cap on the end, and you just threw it. Kind of like the old cap rockets we used to throw when we were kids. And the result was shrapnel. Boom, and shrapnel. Yeah. They also invented the landmine, the electric torpedo or, or mine as we call them today. Uh, of course, the St. John's, the infamous floating up and down the St. John's. 
Yeah. Um, and we, we also had the first uh, use of submarines. Yes, the, uh, the SCSS Hunley. In fact, uh, Friday we were given a very nice painting by uh, a Jacksonville resident whose third great-grandfather was the oldest member of the Hunley crew. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to be putting that on display as well. Soldiers have not changed through the years. Uh, they still have this passion about knives. Uh, it hasn't changed. Uh, probably the most famous knife of all times is the infamous Bowie knife. Uh, who actually yeah, designed the first Bowie knife is still open to controversy. Some say Jim Bowie, who died at the Alamo. Some say his brother, who was a blacksmith, designed it. But this is an actual uh, Bowie knife from that time frame. Quite large, has the clip point, and is still in use today. It, uh, That's a, uh, if I may say so, a bodacious <laughs> Yes, it is. <laughs> That's bad but, looking. you know, contrary to going back to the Hollywood, uh, about less than 1% of the actual wounds during the war were caused by edged weapons. Mm -hmm. Uh, small arms such as the rifle fire, pistol fire, uh, edge weapons wounds were, were, they occurred, but not to the degree that we see on Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Which would include bayonets. Bayonets, right edge weapons. Yeah. This is a, uh, what we call in the, in the museum business as a Dog River Sabre. Uh, most of the Sabres or weapons were known by the manufacturers or the arsenals they were manufactured. This particular one is a generic Confederate sword named after the Dog River in Alabama. So an unidentified, un is uh, usually referred to as a Dog River. Another uh, unique item to the Confederate Army was this type of knife right here. This is known as a D-guard buoy for the handle. Mm -hmm. uh, very prized capture by the Federal, federal Forces. And then, um, excuse me, the uniforms, uh, you yeah, mentioned. The, uh, uniform. yeah, this is actually what is referred to as a Richmond Depot uh, three shell jacket. Uh, the South was short of wool but had plenty of cotton. So they came up with this fabric which is about 20 to 25 percent wool and the remainder is cotton. It became known as jean wool. Uh, it's still quite heavy. Uh, it's still quite hot. Uh, it's lined with what they refer to as Oslenberg. Uh, the black, this actually has the first sergeant stripes on mm -hmm. it. The black, they still use the uh, same branch colors as we use today's army. The only difference is the black was infantry. In today's army, blue is infantry. Yellow is cavalry. We're out of time. I hope oh. you'll come back. Mm -hmm. uh, Van C. Graves, Tesh Brundick, thank you for being with us tonight. And, thank uh, you for having us. Come back again and show us some Please. more of the stuff from the Museum of Southern History. Appreciate it so much being here. That's our show for tonight. Thank you for watching. Uh, the Jacksonville History Show can be seen at 8 p.m. every Wednesday. For more information, go to our website, www.jackshistory.com, or call us at 665-0064. So long, everyone.